Okay, it is um, 11, 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, so we are ready to, to get started. Um, thank you for joining this, um, this session. So as a start, to just remind everyone, these are more thought to be more interactive, not your sort of formal webinars. So you have the chat box, which Genevieve is sitting here with me. Just if you have questions, you want to interrupt, just chat or raise your hand or just open up your microphone and ask questions. And the slides will be made available. The webinar is being recorded. Um, so, it will, so that will also be available. So I want to keep this you know, informal and give people a, a chance to ask, ask questions, really, and not just to sort of plow through the slides. Um, okay. Let's see here. So the learning objectives for today's webinar is really to focus on how whole genome sequence data are used, or maybe you should say would be used in root, routine foodborne disease surveillance without concomitant PFGE. I know that that is basically not done right now, that it's still sort of a parallel and PFGE and WGS, but we will get very, very soon to that stage. So the idea is really to prepare all of us for what the future will look like um, with some insight on how to interpret data, the interpretation pipelines that are coming down, but also just some case studies that were derived from the data that have been created by different state health departments so far. Um, as part of this, we will talk about how to interpret both core genome MLST or whole genome MLST data, which is the platform that CDC will be using to analyze um, whole genome sequence data, but also talk a little bit about whole genome SNP data and how to interpret those. And then finally, to gain insight as to what public health departments can do now to get ready for this future of whole genome sequence-based food point disease surveillance without PFGE. So here's an outline of what I'm going to cover. Um, and first, just quick review sort of why we move into whole genome sequencing with sort of a couple of pictures. And, and I like this one because it illustrates a very valid thing. So this is um, a number of Salmonella Montevideo um, isolates that were characterized by PFGE with two enzymes, and you can see they're all identical. But they came from different sources. Um, with no logic or no epi link. So what we did um, more than five years ago now in this study with the New York State Department of Health is to then perform whole genome sequencing on these isomers and build a tree, and we'll get more into what these trees mean. And you can see very easily that you can separate these isolates that are, look completely identical with PFGE into clades or groups of isolates. And these clades started to make much more sense with regard to outbreaks, um, geographical location, et cetera, so that we could, on the top here, really come up with a group of isolates that represented one outbreak in Rhode Island, uh, linked to a Rhode Island factory that produced them. Um, sausages where the salmonella was most likely introduced with the pepper. And we could separate out isolates that came from pistachios, and we could identify groups of four to five isolates that are very, very similar, such as Sony's putative outbreak clade one. So this shows the power of whole genome sequencing really sort of very visually. Um, another area where whole genome sequencing will have a major impact, and a lot of our examples that arrive from that is Salmonella enteritidis. Um, if you look at most of the data, it suggests that about 50% of Salmonella enteritidis are the same PFGE type, but with whole genome sequencing, we can split that PFGE types into different subgroups, identify clusters, and hopefully detect and identify more outbreaks. So next, I wanted to just sort of talk a little bit about what are the logistics going to look like once we move into whole genome sequence-based surveillance without PFGE. So this is the workflow that I got from Wadsworth currently. And this is still you know, more of an application where we work with CDC, with, where they work with CDC, FDA, and we got Bill Madu and others on the line, and they can also jump in or ask some more questions. So this is the current timeline. So bacterial isolates are received in the lab. It goes through the regular PFGE process. You get data within two to three days. With parallel whole genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing is completed by around day eight. The data are shared with collaborators that then start their analysis, so that will be FDA, CDC, and other states, so Minnesota, for example. And on day 10, 
the in-house analysis are completed. So that's still considerably longer than our PFGE pipeline. But it really is a question of scale. As you have, if you do all genome sequencing, you typically want to run 24 to 48 isolates at a time. So as we move into routine whole genome sequencing, that time is going to compress because we're going to fill up these runs, meaning we have 24 or 48 isolates that we can run together much more quickly, plus we're going to see continued rapid improvements in technology. So what I envision is, is sort of when we cut out PFGE, that we will get to a timeline that is very, very close to PFGE, where we was in five to seven days, and maybe even potentially shorter, um, get whole genome sequence data into the hands of epidemiologists to follow up on these clusters. So I think by the time we implement it and then start to fine tune it, the time difference between PFG and whole genome sequencing is gonna become relatively minimal, particularly in those labs in those states that get enough isolates. If it's labs or states that only get two or three isolates a week of, across organisms, then that might not, the timeline might not be quite as favorable. So what I want to go in next is really talk a little bit about, you know, how do we call things different? How are data reported in whole genome sequencing? Um, to start us out, I mean, the very basics, how do we call isolates different? Um, in all the pipelines we use right now, and I'm going to glance over a lot of the sort of evolutionary biology details and really stick very much with the practical. Two isolates can be different if they have what we call a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. That means one isolate has a C, where another one has a G. And that can happen once in a genome, and your average foodborne pathogen genome is anywhere from three to six million ACTs or Gs, or it could happen twice or three times or more often. And that's what we call a number of SNP differences. Now, that's not the only differences that can occur in a genome. The other one can occur is what's called an indel or an insertion or deletion, where we don't have a change from a C to an A, but we just drop something. A C is deleted, and you can see this below, and you see a typical indel. Importantly, indels and SNPs are used in whole genome MLST to call things different. Indels are not used in what's called high quality SNP analysis. So those are two key methods to analyze data. Whole genome MLST, high quality SNP analysis. Whole genome MLST is what's gonna run through PulseNet, is gonna be what CDC is gonna implement. But you will see, continue to see some of the high quality SNP data. So I'm gonna talk about both. But again, very important to remember, whole genome MLST is the data epidemiologists are most likely going to start seeing once we do routine um, whole genome sequencing without PFG. So let's talk about these data analysis points. So I'm going to start with whole genome um, high quality SNP analysis. So what makes a SNP one of these differences high quality? We basically apply different filters that if X, Y, and C happens, it does not meet our quality thresholds. Again, I'm not going to get into the details, but I'm going to give you a few examples. One filter, for example, might be saying we want to filter, take out any genes that easily move around from one organism to the other, where Salmonella A can get the gene from Salmonella B and now looks very different. It can happen in a day. So these are known as genes that show horizontal gene transfer. Those will be filtered out typically. Another thing we look at is coverage. So what does that mean? So if we sequence a gene, we look at how many data do we have to support that this specific location is an A. If we have 40 independent data from our whole genome sequencing run, then it's called a 40X coverage. Yeah, pretty common sense that that means we're pretty sure that this is correct. If we have a low coverage, we might drop that SNP. It's not a high quality SNP. So we typically set a coverage cutoff in these high quality SNP analysis. That could be 20 cover X coverage, 25 X coverage, 30 X coverage. If anything is below that, we're not going to use it for the analysis. Um, the other thing that we call it is on base frequency. If we have 40 X coverage, but five of them tell us it's a T, 
and 15 talents. It's a C, we might say, well, we're not confident enough in that. We really want to have 90% of the data show that it's a C to have confidence in it. So we can use a cutoff and we typically use a cutoff for that. Um, that's the very basic, the important basis for it. So now the question is, okay, so your lab does these analysis. How do we report this? This all sounds and is pretty complicated at the end of the day. And this is the example I got from Minnesota, how they starting to con communicate between epi and lab. And it's actually very simple. So the epidemiologists get an email from the lab saying, hey guys, we got a new cluster. There are two isolates, here are the two names. They're zero slips from each other. But they basically are identical, which means they have a pretty good chance to have a common source. Or you get an email saying, here's a new cluster. We have two isolates, there are two SNPs from each other. That means two differences of a five million nucleotides, roughly, if it's salmonella. Which means that you know, they're not exactly the same, but they're very, very closely related. Two SNPs, two differences can happen very quickly probably another outbreak worth investigating. So these communications of whole genome sequence data actually don't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as that. And it seems like that's really what Minnesota at this point likes is just simple communications like that. And they evolve from looking at trees, looking at similar matrices to just say, we trust the lab, we've talked enough to each other that that's all we really need and we know how to deal with it. So lesson one from this was really, and from my conversation with Minnesota is it build the trust in the communication between lab and epi where you get to the point that you can do fairly simple communications in most cases. Now we can make it more complicated and we build trees. And I'm giving you a very, very simple example of a tree. We have four sequences that differ by varying degrees. So one and two are clearly the same. Three is different by one snip. Four is quite different. If I look at a tree here, the one on top, I can see one and two are right next to each other with a line, no difference. Three is separated in a separate group, but fairly close to it. Four is fairly different. It's a very simplistic tree. The important thing here to remember is when you look at trees, don't look up and down. Don't say one, and two is similar, then two is similar to three, three is similar to four. Because these trees, you can rotate. So what does that mean every time where you have a node, you can rotate? So if you look at the bottom, I took the same tree as on the top and just simply rotated it. Now four is next to one, even though four is very different. So resistor has the temptation to look up and down, just see what's next to each other but you really look, need to look at the common ancestor, the node that connects two things to interpret those trees. The other confusion with trees sometimes lie, lies in the fact that you can display them a bunch of different ways. And, and I showed some examples here, but at the end of them, they actually are the same thing. They just sort of put in a nice circle so I can fit it more easily on a page, they're flipped upside down, et cetera. But you can pull them all back out and make them a simple tree like the one that's shown on the left side, and figure out which ones share a common ancestor and how similar they are. This is now again another slide from a, from a project that um, New York State Department, um, Minnesota did together with the Wadsworth Center who provided bioinformatics. This now shows a real tree, what we would expect if we were to use trees in a routine surveillance. We have a tree of different Salmonella enteritidis, we have a bunch of them that are very, very similar, and we can just start on the bottom, look at the yellow one. We got five isolates that are very, very similar. There's zero to three SNPs from each other. If these are all human isolates, those are humans we're gonna probably interview to figure out whether we can identify a common source. You can see another one here in blue, zero to two SNPs. So you get clusters, you know the number of SNP differences within it, you decide, based on your experience or some guidance whether you can investigate this outbreak or not. And we're gonna talk about what sort of SNP differences typically say, hey, this is a cluster worth investigating. For Salmonella enteritidis, these cutoffs are, and, and this, we need to be honest, a thing to each other, by and large still somewhat arbitrary, even though they're guided by some scientific evidence, but there's nothing that says five is a better cutoff than six. But five is the cutoff that would be typically used for Salmonella enteritidis. 
So this is really, in my mind, one way of how whole genome sequence-based surveillance could look in terms of a communication between lab and epi, even though, again, this is still high-quality SNP, so that's most likely not what you're going to see. Another way to look at this is to do heat maps, where you just compare each isolate to each other, and the color indicates how different they are. So in this one, you have isolates going down top to bottom, same isolates going left to right. You have the line across the center, and that means it's all white. So white means two isolates have zero differences. Red means they're very different. So you can easily see that on a large scale, but then when we can zoom into certain things, we can see what that really means. And I'm going to show you that in the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to break out one of the ones where you see the isolates are very different. So here you can see you have multiple isolates. You can have isolate, two isolates marked. You can look at them, say, how different are they? 826 SNPs. All right. These two isolates are clearly have nothing to do with each other. They are different by 800 A, C, Ts, and Gs. Okay. Moving on, now let's look at what this heat map would look like if you have isolates that are very similar. We obviously zoom into one of the white areas, go in there, same idea. We pick the isolates we want to compare and say, wow, these two here, different by zero SNPs. These are exactly the same. You have the trees included in this um, heat map, as you can see here, but your heat map is really what tells you how different they are. Your colors guide you as where to look, right? So now let's move. So that's high quality SNP. Now we're gonna move to whole genome MLST. Again, that's gonna be the platform that is gonna move into bionumerics the expectation where we're moving is that that is how data are going to be communicated. The big difference is that rather than looking at the whole genome and basically coming up with these hot quality SNPs, these differences, we break the genome apart into individual genes. And we call these genes the locus for a variety of reasons. And one of them is sometimes we're not going to look at the whole gene. We're going to look at part of a gene. Sometimes the gene isn't responsible for making a protein, but might make something else, might make an RNA. So in order to not use the gene name, we're just gonna call them locus. Any changes in a locus slash gene, and I'm gonna use those two terms interchangeably, is gonna say they're different. So what we can do is in a genome, we have locus one, that's the first gene. In the first seminality sequence, it has the sequence that's shown here. We just call that allele one. Now we sequence another salmonella, and that same gene is slightly different. You have two SNPs marked by red, so we're gonna call this allele two. We're gonna sequence another salmonella, it's the same as allele one, we call it allele one. We sequence another one, that one has now one indel, one SNP, we're gonna call it allele three. So it's a chronological sort of addition of names. Every time two genes are different, to low side difference, we're going to call them different alleles. That causes a couple sort of challenges because it's chronological that typically I would say, I got gene one, allele one, and allele two, they got to be more similar to each other than allele one and allele 500. Not true. Because we simply add them chronologically when we discover them, not by similarity. So don't get fooled by whole genome MLST data, by MLST data, by thinking, just because the allele numbers are similar, that that means the sequences are similar. They can be very different. Make it a little bit simpler, so we have three hypothetical isolates, isolates A, B, C. We got locus one, three isolates are the same. We got locus two, isolate A and B are the same, they're both type eight, allele eight. Isolate C is allele 12. Locus three, isolate A is five, isolate B is five, isolate C is two. We then look at all the loci, up to two or 3,000, depending on what genome you look at. And when we look at all of them, we say same or different. I said A is type A, I said B is type A. That means they're the same on all 2,000 some loci we look at. I said let's C is different, so we're gonna call it type B. Same problem, I can say A and B is different, but I have no clue whether they're different in one locus or 500 loci, right? That is the challenge with this type of MLST naming. 
Now, this just gives you an example how that looks more from a screenshot from what biomimetics might look like. So you have a tree because you can use whole genome MLST to build trees. You can look at your loci. So there they're called LMO, 1 through 17. So those are basically the first few loci for Listeria monocytogenous. And you can see LMO7 in the middle. They're all number 10. They're all the same. But then you can see one isolate is different. Now, we only see 17 loci of 2,000 plus. So while some isolates look like they're exactly the same here, they are. They're just going to be different in other loci. That's why the tree shows them as different. But here you're back to staring at you know, trees in order to make sense out of these low side. So the way the system is really going to work builds on what we've talked about so far. CDC and binomerics have come up as a um, naming scheme that I'm going to sort of describe as a whole genome zip code. So rather than giving two whole genome MLST names, different numbers and that's it, number one and number two, because you're not knowing whether number one and two are seven alleles apart, one allele apart, or 300 alleles apart, we're gonna do a naming scheme, or CDC is gonna do a naming scheme that consists of multiple subgroups, and exactly six of them. I just realized that my example only has five, but that doesn't really matter. So where every number basically gives you the difference at a different level. So if I have two isolates that have the same zip code, exactly, that means they're exactly the same. If I have two isolates that have the same zip code on the first four numbers, only the last number differs, that means they're different, but they're different in less than seven alleles. So they're still very close. If I have some where the first three are the same, but the last two are different, then that means they're different by 15 alleles. And you can, again, still binomials can display it in trees, it can color code them, show you which ones are exactly the same, which is what you see here, and which ones are different by a few of them, but it makes it easier now to interpret those data. Let's make it a little bit easier to sort of take this example out. So here's what you would look like this could look like. So you have two isolates that are exactly the same, no difference, you get the same zip code. You have two isolates or three isolates with some different by one to seven alleles, forget about that header. So you have patient one and two are the same, but patient three has this first number is the same, but the last number is different. That means number three differs from one and two by one to seven alleles. For an outbreak investigation, probably want to include patient three as part of the interview to find a common um, exposure. How does it look like with more isolates? The last one has four isolates. Again, ignore the header there, screw that one up. And um, patient one and two are exactly the same. Patient three, now we add another patient to it, patient four. The last two letters of the zip code are different. Now that one means patient four is different by eight to 15 alleles relative to one, two, and three. Pretty different, probably not gonna include it at least in our initial um, questionnaires where we look for common exposure. But if you have some evidence that, you know what, in this case, eight to 15 might make sense to look at them, we could, but typically would not include that one. So you move from trees to long lists of genes to to a, a system that actually would be relatively easy to interpret. And there we are then just simply back to, you know, where we were. We can go to the same thing. We can say, hi folks, lab sense epidemic, we got a new cluster, two isolates, there are zero alleles from each other. And you get the isolate names and you might even get the zip code visit. Or, hey guys, we got a new cluster, Two isolates are two alleles from each other. You get the isolates names, you get the zip code. Basically the same thing as you would get with high quality SNP, just now it says alleles from each other, not SNPs from each other. Very simple, provides guidance what outbreaks you wanna investigate or what clusters you wanna investigate, I should say. Now, you can make it more complicated. You could get an email like this. Hey guys, looks like we may have a cluster here. Five, here's the number of isolates, 
the first three are your cluster. There are a couple other ones that are on this list because it's a historic list. The last patient has nothing to do with anything. And again, I should have named that patient five. Patient four is within seven to 15, but we know we really need to in investigate the first three patients and interview those. So not quite as simple as the first email that says what's in your cluster, but it gives you a list and you can look at it pretty quickly, figure out what's in that cluster. Then just like this whole genome, uh, this high quality SNP, you can build trees. You can build trees that look slightly different, which are called minimum spanning trees, or you can get the same old trees that look exactly the same way as the high quality SNP trees. If you look at them very often, you might not even be easily able to tell whether it's a high quality SNP tree or a whole genome MLST tree. They can basically look the same, except that if we annotate the differences, we say allele differences versus SNP differences. So what are the relative you know, advantages of the two methods? As I said, important for everyone to sort of realize whole genome MLST is where it's gonna go. Um, Advantage of whole genome sequence is it's phylogenetically informative. That's a way to say that it's actually based on evolutionary patterns. It really doesn't just say they look similar, but they are also actually derived from a common ancestor. They came from the same mother cell. The major disadvantages are really two. One of them is it takes a while to build the initial database that allows us to do whole genome MLST. That's going to be one of the bottlenecks as we develop these technologies for different organisms. We obviously are very close to having this ready for uh, mono, but then as we look at other organisms, it tells the time while. The second thing is that the assignment of alleles can be take a while, can be computationally costly. The way I've talked to um, CDC yesterday on this, their system will work is that it will initially call alleles directly from the reads they come off this genome sequence. That's a few minute process. Then overnight, or could be over the day, over 12 to 14 hours, a more complex analysis we've done where we actually assemble the genomes and then call alleles and basically check them against the initial quick calling. The advantage of this is it's easy to use for surveillance. It's particularly useful for distributed testing networks such as the PulseNet labs and the public health labs because it gives you those zip code type names. You can also do this whole genome MLST pull out and very quickly identify virulence genes, genes that predict antibiotic resistance. So if I, have a, if I do a whole, um, whole genome MLST analysis, I can still pull out the resistance gene and say, okay, this isolate is most likely resistant to penicillin, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline. I can tell you predict this isolate is most likely or is with high confidence, salmonella, um, you name your favorite salmonella serotype, salmonella typhi, salmonella um, sero, salmonella, whatever. And you can say, oh, okay, I know it's salmonella Dublin based on my whole genome MLST. Therefore, I need to cows, calves, some bovine reservoir is a likely source to look at my interviews. Okay. So advantages is you of overall is, is that you have that, so that allows you with reference characterization. You can compare it back to your reference database of serotypes. You don't need to do serotyping. Um, number of other sort of advantages that really relate more or less to the, the computation on the biology of it, which I'm not going to go into it, but the most important one is probably the potential for a stable nomenclature, which makes it much easier to communicate across groups with or genome MLST. And that then means also that the individual state health departments really typically may have no need or very limited need for doing bioinformatics by the users. Now, again, remember, this is something we looking forward in year to two years, but I think based on my understanding, this listeria this is going to come pretty quickly. Um, high quality SNP, there's still going to be situations where high quality SNP analysis are going to be used. One of them is going to be where we don't have a whole genome MLST database which is one of the reasons why for right now we use it for Salmonella enteritidis, we use it for Salmonella because the high, whole genome MLST database that is needed for whole genome isn't ready yet. The other thing is that in some situation it might actually provide a higher amount of resolution for strain comparisons. 
So what that means is because with the whole genome MLST, we look at different genes, there's certain pieces of information that we don't look at it, high quality SNP might provide better resolution. Whether that really holds true and whether that holds true for all organisms or only certain organisms will remain to be determined. Because you might remember that I showed you that whole genome MLST actually uses more differences. If I have an indel, one of those insertion deletions, my whole genome MLST is going to call it different, while my high-quality SNP will call it the same. So it could go the other way, really going to be, be an area where we need some more um, experience going down the road. So what I'm going to focus on for the last few slides is really some real-world examples from both Minnesota and New York, how this, this has been used. And I'm going to sort of take out the part where the, the, the parallel PFGE, because again, all of this still had parallel PFGE. But you could take out the PFGE data and basically see what it would look like in a whole genome sequencing only world. Um, this one I already showed you. This is a high quality SNP tree. You do whole genome sequencing, you get these trees. These trees indicate the number of SNP differences. You look at them, you know what outbreaks to investigate. Um, here's one example. So these are isolates, and you can see in the header, these are still isolates within one PFGE type. You have unique whole genome sequences in light blue. In orange, you have what's called cluster one. So this is four isolates from four humans that differ by zero SNPs. You have cluster two, which is in green, that differs by zero SNPs among the two of them. So the two greens are exactly the same, but they differ by six to seven SNPs from cluster one. And then you have cluster three, two isolates here that differ by zero SNPs from each other. So this gives you basically three clusters to investigate, one, two, and three, but some in the back of your mind, you are like, you know, one and two, one and two could be connected to each other because those are only differ six to seven SNPs from each other. So, when Minnesota looked at those clusters, here's cluster one and two, so those are the two that are very similar. Um, looked at them, you could see there was some common denominator of store brand stuffed chickens, a chicken Kiev type thing. So Epi indicated there could be a common link, could have been a similar product, product was made with the same ingredients, et cetera. Um, but at the end, there was no specific source that could identify that put those two clusters together. Now another thing to, to mention is with sometimes with these clusters, so if you get two cases that have exactly the same whole genome sequence, what you might find is simple, a, simply a common travel history. Two people that both traveled to country X, village A, and sometimes travel to country X, village A, and stayed at the same resort. So you will start to find with this travel associated outbreaks, but because of the legislation of the country where the, the sources have no chance to actually investigate it. Um, now let's look at cluster three. So these are two isolates, zero SNP differences. These were actually part of a multi-state live poultry investigation, both reported contact with live poultry. In the one case, they actually went back to some environmental samples, found it positive for salmonella enteritis, found zero to one SNPs. So both of them linked to live poultry, probably, um, with whole genome sequencing. So these are the sort of outbreaks you will start or detect in small outbreaks with whole genome sequencing. So to summarize, we talked about communication of results from the lab to epi. Trees are one big way to do it. Heat maps are one big way to do it. But more commonly, particularly with whole genome MLST, we're going to go into simple emails, spreadsheets, naming of clusters, and just a list of these whole genome MLST zip codes. Here's another example just to illustrate what that looks like. So this is the type of spreadsheets you're going to get from um, that Minnesota uses. So it gives you the lab ID, the number of SNP differences to the closest relative. So the closest isolate is listed here. And then it assigns cluster IDs based on Cutoffs. And again, these cutoffs are driven by data and experience, but are still somewhat arbitrarily, whether we say less than five alleles is what we investigate, less than seven alleles is what we investigate. 
Um, example from New York State, which used prospective whole genome sequencing to identify clusters, and this was specifically for Salmonella enteritidis. Um, if you look at this, there were a total of um, 61 clusters that were identified, um, 10 clusters that could not be investigated, which is a number of cases. In these clusters, the range of cases in a given cluster, so you see most of these are very, very, are small clusters. There's a median of, of two cases in a cluster. And so a number of them, as I mentioned before, um, could be travel associated. For 25% of the clusters, there could be a, a investigated epidemiological links were identified. So one, as we move, for example, to Salmonella, Salmonella whole genome MLST, and specifically Salmonella enteritidis, we're going to see a lot more clusters and really go over to a point where lab and epidemiologists can't look over trees with every cluster and you know, identify which ones to include or not include in a in an interview and in a, in a finding of a common um, denominator or a common exposure. So the conclusions for you and either way sort of a start of a conversation, and this is based on, you know, as the slides are presented, you also discussions I had with both in New York and we had in New York, we had with Minnesota, we had with CDC. The key part is whole genome sequence-based surveillance will require close collaboration between lab and EPIs and the building of a, of a much tighter relationship than we even have with PFGE for most of the states. We will need training of more epidemiologists in the basics of whole genome sequencing to reach a level of comfort with the tools and the data to start to speak the lingo and know what it means and, and be able to have discussions with the lab. Um, but ultimately, what Minnesota said, the most important thing is to decide how to communicate whole genome sequence results. I think from now until when we start routine whole genome sequencing, it makes sense to try to start communication, see how do we look at trees, what are real differences, what do other people do, have communications and have conversations like we're having here, to prepare for it and prepare for the time where that's the only data that is going to be communicated. The big thing, obviously, is to determine the number of the cutoffs for SNPs or more important allele differences, because again, you're going to use whole genome MLST. Data cluster is worth investigating. For Salmonella enteritis, experience tells most people that that's around five SNPs or five alleles. For Listeria monosatogenes, that seems to be around five to seven alleles. The typical practical and pragmatic approach is going to be that we take an initial more stringent cutoff saying, okay, we have listeria that are less than five alleles different. We're going to really look at common exposure or if same thing for seminal enteritis, but it could be two or three alleles there. Once we looked at that, we then also going to start looking at other close related isolates. If we have some that are less than seven alleles, less than five alleles. So there's a secondary cutoff we might look at to include some more isolates in some of those cases. That's still going to be somewhat you know, ad hoc and based on experience, but we're going to have to start being comfortable with a somewhat arbitrary cutoff, again, based on science, based on experience. But that's always been this is no difference from PFG. And just PFG, we can't see the differences. It's implied. Here we know the differences. So that's what I had with that. I'm happy to open it up for um, questions, comments. You can use the chat. You can open up your microphone and just talk to us. And also from uh, Du and Bill and others from New York State to chime in if they want to clarify any of this. So with that, let's see whether we have any questions here. Bill and Madhu, anything you want to share in terms of your experiences at New York? How does this works? What some of the challenges are? What some of the challenges you foresee as we move towards routine or genome sequencing without PFG? So this, this is Madhu. You know, one thing I'll say is that um, um, actually, Amy Robbins has really developed with the lab, um, with Bill and the lab, quite a um, quite an interesting um, sharing of data where we both have access 
to the same site, um, I know that that uh, we we in Epi can put in anything that we're requesting for whole genome sequencing, and the lab can put in anything that's also been um, routine that they're doing routinely, and we the lab then puts in the results. And we also share what the epi background is and what the ultimate conclusion is. So it's a nice landing spot for both of us to see all information in one spot. And I think that speaks exactly to the point that the lab and the epidemiologists need to really figure out what's best for them, what will work for them in a given state. It's going to, going to be some differences of how these are communicated, I think, from state to state based on a variety of factors from you know volume of whole genome sequencing done to everything else. So now one question we got is how close are we to developing a um, whole genome MLST database for salmonella? Um, all I can do is speculate on that one. Um, I don't know Bill, Madhu, as you guys have anything for that. I'm gonna say the Listeria one is pretty close. I think the salmonella one, it's I would expect it to be before the end of the year, but I think we, this is not one of those things which is uh, like building a car. You could run into certain issues then it might take longer. But again, that's driven by bionumerics and CDC, so I'm not quite sure. Anyone else, Bill, Madhu, any insights of what your expectations are for the um, Salmonella or Genome MLST database? Maybe the bigger question becomes what's, what's first? Is it going to be Salmonella or is it going to be STAC? Um, and and I'm, I'm not even sure whether that's really clear, but we can sort of ping CDC and figure out whether they have any insights on that. But I think it's mainly speculations, even on most of our part. Um, the other question was is how close are we developing the, the zip code type nomenclature for Salmonella? So again, this is driven, this is, is a related question. The whole genome MLST database needs to be there first. Then we need to develop that sort of zip code type nomenclature. Um, I think a couple of things that are still gonna be up in the air is whether the number of differences that a different number indicates is gonna be the same across organisms. So if you know, the differ by the last number, that means more than seven alleles different, but that is for Listeria, it might be more than five, then less than five alleles different for Salmonella. I'm expecting it to be the same probably for simplicity, but it may not be. So I think those are some of the real sort of unknowns there yet that will be, will be figured out. And so again, that's why we are at this position where we're right now, where we mainly still look at trees and heat maps. Other question again, you can also open up your microphone and just ask them. Bill, do you want to share your thoughts in terms of timing, how you think if you're on, how this is gonna gonna work in in, in the in the future? In terms of how quickly we're gonna get whole genome sequencing data. No, yeah, seems like Bill is not on there. All right, Madhu, that's a question for you. What was the timeline for the 61 clusters that were identified? Uh, I believe those 61 were over one year. It was the initial year we started doing whole genome sequencing. So it was from October of, um, oh, I'm blanking, October of 13 or 14 to the, yeah, it was October of 13 to October of 14, I believe. And that was among all Salmonella enteritis, or was it that, that specifically was specific. PFG type four or five or something like that? Yep, it was specific to Salmonella enteritis um, pattern. I think it was like pattern or endemic pattern, so patterns four, five, and twenty-one. Okay, so it wasn't even all. And that would represent what about 70, 75 percent of all Salmonella enteritis, those three PFG types. Yep. Yeah, I would say I would say even probably closer to like eighty percent for us. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Martin. This is Bill. I am on the call. I was just having a hard time figuring out how to get the microphone into call in. So, okay. Um, 
What was the question you had for so me? The question was, I mean, in terms of timeline for how quickly you will get a whole genome sequence, a result from a whole genome sequence, even saying, hey, these three isolates are the same. Mm-hmm. Once we move towards routine implementation and really have enough sort of, of a number of isolates to not have to wait to fill up a, a run on the equipment. Right. It's unlikely that it'll be any less than five days. I think that's our record, and that just happens because of very good timing for batching and stuff. Because yeah. the machines require us to r- run 16 to 24 isolates at a time to make them cost effective. We have to sort of, we do have to batch things. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, once it's routine and full time, we probably can do two batches a week and, you know, results will be reported in five to 10 days uh, to Epi on a routine basis. The CDC has a, a, a target of, 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 of completing sequencing within seven working days. Um, and they are uh, trying to develop. The thing that slows us down right now is that PFG still comes first and then we proceed with the uh, uh, whole genome sequencing. So uh, it will get faster, but uh, for the moment, you know, the sort of 10 days is probably about right, eight to 10 days before we get an answer to our FDs. So the important thing, if ever, is that sort of 16 to 24 isolates. Every time, once you've got 16 to 24 accumulated, you throw it in the machine and run the whole genome sequencing. So you, you can know, look at your current number of isolates come in and basically calculate what it will be for your state. If you have one lab, if you don't, and, and how this is gonna, gonna work. If it takes you, and I have no idea for some for the different states, how long it might take to accumulate 16 to 24 isolates. Once you have 24 isolates, you throw it on the machine. It's what the, as Bill says, about you know, 24 hours, 24 hours, something like that for analysis. That's what you're gonna, or slightly longer, that's what you're gonna get, but it's getting those 16 to 24 isolates. Now, that's not set in stone in the long-term future as new technology platforms come on, we might be able to run much fewer at the same time. Sort of thinking of like you could run a big gel or a small gel, but right now all we got is a big PFG gel. So the equivalent on whole genome sequence, we need 16 to 24 to not break the bank in terms of cost. Okay, one question was, are the trees available online for us to browse through and apply filters to? Um, Bill and Madhu, do you wanna sort of talk about how um, that works at New York State Department of Health right now? I think for whole genome MLST, the trees will be available through Binumerics. Binumerics will give you those trees and you can look at those trees. Yeah, for, this is Bill again, for the people we, uh share with like Madhu and those guys and also some other states that we do stuff for. We send them the tree uh, as a PDF typically or as a JPEG so they can't really manipulate it. Um, If they want to look at a cluster more closely it is possible for us to use some software we have uh, that takes the sort of uh, file format that the tree is in which is not a PDF or a JPEG and sort of zoom in on it and that's actually what we end up sharing with them typically is not the whole tree, which would include say 600 or 1,000 isolates potentially, but just the little region of the tree where the cluster of interest exists. Um, so we can do that. We could, it's not soft, hard, difficult software to use, but um, you know, right now that sort of capability for what we do doesn't exist. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, we just do the zooming in, so to speak, for our Madhu and her and um, the appies we collaborate with. And another point there is really to sort of think about, and it's derived from what Minnesota and Carlota at Minnesota told me is really that sort of how do you communicate between lab and appies if you're in different cities or different locations? To think about, you know, do you have screen sharing software like the Zoom software we use here? I mean, any one of you could share their screen with me and show me a tree, and I could say, zoom in there, zoom in there. So if you don't have access to those tools, to sort of explore some of those so that you can work together, even if you're in different locations, and to get us zoom into a screen could be very useful. So there's some sort of ancillary technologies that can really help. 
and that will help you beyond whole genome sequencing too, as you look at and into those communications. So the thing, remember, sort of building some of these communication pipelines is going to be really, really important, and sometimes that might mean different technology tools even there. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, uh, it's Dean Middleton calling from Ontario. And the, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the level that this training appears to be uh, targeting is sort of state level. And I'm wondering if about training at, at sort of, I'll call it sub-state level. So in Ontario, we have 36 health units, and, and I'm trying to figure out how we provide training to those, um, those 36 health units that are, you know, sub-provincial level. And, and um, any comments on your experience in that regard? So I'll give it a first shot and see who else wants to chime in. I guess my, my one question is, are you talking more to the epidemiologist, the people who would do um, interviews, the epidemiologists, I presume it would be your target audience there, right? Yeah, and I, I, I throw it back to say, to you, to say, do, do you only target the epis, or I, I'm um, concerned about the uh, public health inspectors, in wow. that, you know, whether they need to know this, or at what level, so that when we speak to them, we're speaking in the same language. Uh, it's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, so, so, so the way it, where we are, and we ask ourselves exactly the same question. So where we are right now is the lab people seem to be the one that first got most of the training for the obvious reasons, because they need to run that. And the epidemiologist is where CDC in the U.S. now focuses a lot of efforts, including through the Food Safety Centers of Excellence, which is this. Um, you know, the environmental health groups is something where we starting to think about you know, some of them are online for this and some of them are participating and really what we focused in the Northeast is bringing the three groups together, environmental health, epi, and lab to make sure these communications happen. But as you pointed out, by and large, it's at the state level or the big city health departments that may even do whole genome sequencing themselves. I think most of us struggle with exactly the same thing is how do we push this down to the you know, in, in here, here it will be county level. Um, for you guys, it will be down to the, the sub-level that you described. Uh, how much do they need to know? Is it going to be um, just, hey, these are different, same fingerprint, different fingerprints, forget about all the technical parts of it. And, and I think that's almost where we are right now, that for the time being, it's going to be more like that. But I think... Some of us, including myself, are still not quite comfortable and feel like we do need to do a little bit more training. Um, what we can do is we can give you, so we've done another series that is sort of national. So we have two things going on in parallel here. This is really targeted towards the Northeast for people to really work amongst each other, build these relationships. We have a more national training um, that we're also working on with CDC. And we'll, if you send me an email, we will send you the origin of we'll send you some of the links to the modules that are up there. So we're developing some other resources. If those you feel are still too high level, I think I'd love to sort of have some more conversations with you in terms of what do we, how do we take it down to that next level? And I think there's going to be some interest, you know, among different states and the CDC here to what is that next level to move, move it down. But short answer, yeah, okay. we don't, and same, same challenges, we don't have a good answer really. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. And I, I think I may have um, access to those links, but it, it, like, to be honest, I, I did think they were still, like I'll say, either a higher level, if that's condescending, or not the right level for um, sort of the frontline workers. Um, but in, in any case, it sounds like you're having the same challenge. So, so be Right, it. yeah. No, I, I agree with you. Looking at those is that they are at a too high a level, and that's a good one. I mean, maybe Let's talk offline a little bit what you think should be covered. I think we have, probably have some of the content and just need to, to move it down a little bit more. All right. Another yeah. question was the biological implications of whole genome MLST versus SNP differences. So, um, so in whole genome MLST, so if we look at, we can look at SNPs and whole genome MLST, we can look at SNPs as a high quality SNP. There the biological differences are Number one, that in whole genome MLST, 
these difference are typically in a gene. So a gene is a part of the genome that encodes a protein. In high quality SNPs, we also look at differences that are outside genes. And so these are parts of the genetic material that don't really make a protein. So it isn't as important for bacterial organisms to maintain the same sequence there. So with high quality SNP, you potentially pick up more differences because you look at differences in regions that are not under strong pressure to stay the same. So that's one important difference. The other one obviously evolves around the indels, the insertions and deletions. These can occur very, very quickly. So you can get two isolates that in a specific locus get different because of an indel. We've shown that can happen very, very quickly, very, very frequently, because sometimes there's actually a biological reason to change from a 5As to 4As. It's a way to shut down a gene or change a gene. So we can pick up some of the, so both of them will pick up some of those differences that happen faster. The relative importance of those will differ by organisms. So for example, a non-foodborne pathogen, Helicobacter, has a lot of these long stretches of A, 9, or 10, A's or T's and G's, which change very quickly. It's a biological mechanism to allow it to quickly adapt to different environments. Other organisms don't have that much of it. They still have them, but less of it. Um, Jade, did that answer your question? And if not, you can also just you know, clarify it by, if you can open up a microphone and talk to us. Okay, we got time for one more question or comment. Okay, and if you have any other comments, you know, what was useful, what was not useful about it, what do you want to see in the next one, um, let us know. And in the next one of this series, we're going to focus on now how to use whole genome um, sequencing by itself to, to trace back um, outbreaks to source. So we're going to bring in, you know, routine sequencing of food isolates and how does that play into this whole picture. Well, so far, we just focused really on human disease surveillance. Okay. With that, thank you very much. I hope you found it useful and we'll also send you a link to the recording of it. And we will also make all the slides available. So if you want to use them internally, you can have those too. Okay, thank you.